It seems There's, like such a slimy thing it to is. do. And, and this is funny because these major companies have always been back room, you know, in conference rooms and mm -hmm. having conversations and they have so much money. They're like, hey, let's do this because I think we can make a return mm -hmm. at the expense of investors. Yeah. And now that it got democratized where there was these subreddit groups where people can come together in mass quantities with minor amounts of money uh -huh. and start manipulating the market. Now we're like, oh, we want regulation. <laughs> oh, yeah. Now that it's being done to you, you want regulation, yeah. please. Uh -huh. Oh, so, how the turntables have turned. <laughs> <laughs> money can be complicated. Let a nerd help you. We're here to demystify the complex nature of money by getting you answers from financial nerds and whiz kids. Welcome to Ask the Money Nerds, a weekly segment of the Wealth Labs podcast where we answer your most pressing money questions. We have a question on how to create a fixed income in the future and whether indexed annuities are a good idea or not. And I've got some opinion on that. Or indexed universal life. Could that be a potential tax-free income in the future? It could have, might be. Might be a potential disaster too, though. So let's get into it. Still, but I know this is a question that you're going to learn from because you don't, you're like, what the hell is all this that we're talking about? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to be learning right <laughs> along with all of the viewers and listeners, which I have no shame in admitting. And I'm on the financial journey, just like a lot of people are. So mm -hmm. we'll answer Joel's question, but I figured we'd pull a quote card since we okay. haven't done that in a while. And I'm a quote junkie. So I'm all right, always, let's see. I'm let's, let's see it. quote junkie. Um, okay. There's only one corner of the universe that can be certain of improving and that your own self yeah but i don't know mr right. huxley but i would definitely yeah, agree with a, that that's a good one yeah only one corner of the universe you can be certain of improving and that's your own self mm -hmm. cool yeah starts at home starts with yourself i love oh, it now you're doing two cards i am i might oh. as well uh change is hard at first messy in the middle and gorgeous at the end yeah Says i agree robin sharma i like robin sharma stuff too the this monk the who sold his Ferrari. Did you ever read that? I haven't. It was a great book. I feel like I could spend my life reading books that my friends recommend. There are so many good ones out there. You know, yeah. that's one that I, I don't even pretend that I'm going to get to most of the books at this point. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm, it's almost know. impossible yeah. to try to keep up. I'm always really ambitious and developing a reading list and then I don't always get through it. But yeah. All right. Let's ambitions. get to the question now. Okay. Joel's question. I have two actually. Mm -hmm. uh, first, what are your thoughts on no fee fixed indexed annuities as a stable income option? I know usually to steer clear of the stock market and mm -hmm. to look at the guarantees, but I haven't been able to really find a downside of them except for the surrender fees. Secondly, what about indexed universal life policies as a tax-free retirement option? My understanding is they are supposed to have similar function as overfunded whole life policies because you would be taking out a loan as your income, but any more information about this would be helpful. So let's start with the okay. first part. No fee fixed index annuities. Define that for us and then let us know if that's a stable income option. All right. So let's just talk about annuities for a second. There's, there's three main types and everything else is a hybrid. It's kind of like insurance. You've got your fixed annuities, mm -hmm. which are like, here's what your interest rate is, right? You've got your indexed annuities, which are, will give you some type of guarantee, which might be a positive percentage or no, no loss, right? Just that you get your principal. Mm -hmm. And then there's an upside potential with a cap where okay. it, you know, if the market goes higher than a certain amount, you might not be able to participate or there's a fee that's less than what the market made. And then there's variable annuities. Okay. And so variable annuities are typically, they have separate accounts that are a lot like mutual funds and they might have provisions that make you have things that feel fixed, like what your income is if you annuitize. So annuities were originally intended to annuitize. And think of it as like the opposite of life insurance. Life insurance was a design that if you die prematurely, this money comes in to indemnify that death so that your family has some money to continue on or whatever. Mm -hmm. Annuities are, what if you outlive your money? So you could get an annuity that says, we're going to keep paying you every single month until the day you die. Mm -hmm. So if you live past life expectancy, you still get those payments. Got it. Now, annuities became something that got changed or evolved where people stopped annuitizing them they started using them as an accumulation vehicle oh, right mm -hmm. so and they and they were always intended to accumulate until it was time to take income but a lot of times people would just accumulate but they never annuitized mm -hmm. the problem with annuitization for a lot of people is now they're locked in once they annuitize mm -hmm. that's what they're getting okay right 
And so they can't just go take the money out the next day. Mm -hmm. Whereas a whole life policy has more flexibility to do that. Right. And it's, it's, it's kind of apples to oranges looking at mm -hmm. life insurance, cash value to an annuity. Mm -hmm. Like it's more like people were competing with annuities versus mutual funds, but let's just take variable annuities versus mutual funds. The reason I don't like variable annuities is because there's a much higher fees, much higher expenses, mm -hmm. and those expenses can dip into your performance, but they would come out and say, well, if you annuitize, we'll guarantee that you at least get 6% because now the, you know, insurance company offering that they could do certain things to make sure that they were profitable. So what they typically do is buy options and, you know, and so, and then buy zero coupon bonds, which might mature at a certain date, or they buy options on the market so that if it goes up, it gives them the fuel. If it goes down, they, they do what's called straddling it where you, you have like certain, um, I don't want to go into all the details of it, but essentially it kind of hedges the downside and gives you potential for the upside. And so I don't have a fan of variable annuity. Because yeah. if you're really just going to invest in the market, just invest in the market. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's saying, well, but what if the market goes down and now you can annuitize? People <laughs> don't like to annuitize. This person's saying that they might be willing to annuitize. Mm -hmm. So the indexed option is saying, hey, we want to make sure that we don't lose. But we want to participate in some of the upside because we don't really know what the market holds in the mm -hmm. future. Right now, indexed annuities, what you have to watch for is cap rates. Okay. Cap rates are the rate at which you no longer get to participate in the upside. And because interest rates have mm -hmm. been so low, those mm -hmm. cap rates haven't been great. Yeah. Because what they were doing originally was buying a zero coupon bond, which means you buy something for, let's say $100,000 and it says, hey, 10, 15 years from now, that $100,000 is now going to be $200,000. So it's just you get that mm -hmm. $200,000 at the end of it. Well, when interest rates are low, it might take a lot longer to get to 200,000 or you don't get even close to 200,000. So they make very, very low minimum guarantees if just principal. And then with a certain percentage of the money, they're buying options on the stock market. You okay. already know I'm not an options fan, right? Where you've got call options that you think oh, the market's going to go up, but now you have an exaggerated up because mm -hmm. you're have margin, right? Yeah. Um, Would the Reddit situation and GameStop be a a small example of that. So with the Reddit and GameStop situation was you have hedge funds that were shorting a company GameStop yeah. that they didn't think had a viable business model. Yeah. And they thought with all that downward pressure, cause they're shorting it, expecting it to go down. Yeah. yeah. They're basically they're gonna betting, make on, money. A they're betting on the f company failing, but then the Reddit democratized all these people <laughs> say, no, we're going to go long. We're not going short. We want this to survive. And they kept yeah. putting money in it, which would eventually expire those, those, put options or the yeah. short sell mm -hmm. and then those funds would lose which I loved because mm -hmm. I don't like companies that go <laughs> we want to put this company out by putting downward pressure on what mm -hmm. we're doing independent of what's happening in the company because they think so anyway it seems like such a slimy thing it to is. do <laughs> and and this is funny because these major companies have always been back room you know in conference rooms and having conversations and they have so much money they're like, Hey, let's do this. Cause I think we can make a return mm -hmm. at the expense of investors. Yeah. And now that it got democratized where there was these subreddit groups where people can come together in mass quantities with minor amounts of money uh -huh. and start manipulating the market. Now we're like, Oh, we want regulation. <laughs> oh yeah. Now that it's being done to you, you want regulation, yeah. please. Uh -huh. Oh, so, how the turntables have turned. <laughs> <laughs> so the index, I'm not a huge fan of them unless you can find the right cap rates. Okay. And if you're willing to annuitize pretty soon, then I become more of a fan. The older you are, the more it makes sense if you're just trying to create a consistent income. Mm -hmm. And they might say, hey, between your principal and interest, we'll give you 7.5% per year. Okay, that's not bad because right now interest rates are so low, it's hard to create a good cash flow mm -hmm. on fixed income, yeah. on guaranteed returns. They're something that you've got a backing of like, you know, a company mm -hmm. where most people are in the stock market, it might go up and down. So this does okay. stabilize that and make sure they don't run out of money. They're just not going to be able mm -hmm. to get access to the full amount okay. once they annuitize. Mm -hmm. So the surrender charges are substantial on most annuities. Yeah where you could have them for as long as 15 years. Now that's what only- What does that even mean? It might mean that the first year, it's like a huge amount if you take the full thing out. 
because they want you to stay in it. Because remember, they're buying yeah. options and zero coupon they want you bonds in it for the and, long haul. Right, but if you're going to annuitize, that's not as big of a deal. Okay, they'll let you do that without the penalty. Mm -hmm. But if you want to take that money back out before annuitizing, there are major surrenders because they're paying big commissions on these things. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they pay a bonus that first year, where hey, we're going to give you a ten percent bonus on your money or something to stay in, but that's because they have a surrender charge. Mm -hmm. So you have to be careful of those, and that's right. But an immediate annuity, whether it's a fixed annuity or an indexed annuity, just it just depends on what is available, what are they guaranteeing you to get every single year between the principal and interest. And if you're really looking for income, it definitely can be a viable option. Okay. Is, is there an age range that is more ideal for a person to invest in? I mean, when you're young, it doesn't make a lot of sense to do these kind okay. of things. Uh, when you're actually in your creating income years and you've got a lump sum of money, then it might make more sense. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Now index universal life. So let's go. Yeah. His yeah. second question is what about index universal life policies as a tax free retirement option? Is anything ever really tax free Garrett? Well, it's tax. It's, it's a tax benefit or it's tax favored. You take mm -hmm. after tax dollars, yep. net income, and mm -hmm. you can put it in these plans. Yep. When it grows, you can pull it out in a withdraw and that comes back to you as the money you put in first known as FIFO first mm -hmm. in first out. And then when it's only gains left, you can borrow. When you borrow, it's your money used as collateral. The insurance company gives you their money. Therefore, you haven't triggered that tax on it. Mm -hmm. When you die, the death benefit can pay off the loan, and it could potentially be tax-free if the cost of insurance doesn't increase too much mm -hmm. and start eating away and require you to pay money back. Got it. So universal life, I have one policy index universal life, but everything else I have is overfunded whole life. Mm -hmm. Overfunded whole life doesn't look as good on paper because it's guaranteed minimum interest rate, guaranteed your premium never goes up, guaranteed that once the cash is in there, it's yours, right? Guaranteed death benefit. So when there's that much risk mitigation, the insurance companies are gonna say, here's what we're giving you. And it doesn't look as good mm -hmm. um, as Index Universal Life, but you've gotta look at the non-guaranteed versus the guaranteed side. So the guaranteed side, if you look at the guaranteed cost, it will always take your policy to zero. But they also don't just jump to guaranteed cost day one. It doesn't ever happen. But over time, it can. The problem is most people are looking over 20 years, not 40 years. And when we think way into the future, there's so much that can happen. And if you miss a payment, it might negate some of your guarantees that are on your side that are beneficial. Mm -hmm. Or if you take cash out of the policy, it might increase what's called your net amount at risk, which means mm -hmm. it's the difference between your death benefit and your cash value. Yeah. And if you start decreasing your cash value, it could increase your cost of insurance because there's more insurance being charged between the death benefit and the cash value if it's being used. Yeah. But most people are only looking at the accumulation, not looking at the distribution. So uh, I do not mm -hmm. like the distribution phase for, for universal life policies. Okay. I would prefer whole life policies. But for a death benefit like what I'm using it for, no mm -hmm. problem. Um, it's just that in your later years, the cost of insurance can actually increase. So that's my problem. Okay. Anything else on that? I guess I'm wondering, I'm trying to figure out how to articulate my question, but how do you know when you're buying a policy, am I getting it just for the death benefit versus? Well, I like to get it for cash value and death benefit. That's why I buy whole both. life. Okay. Yeah. So you do both. When the you only reason I have one universal life policy is because mm -hmm. it was a, it was known as a premium finance deal. Okay. Or the bank financed it for me. Mm -hmm. And they gave me a really low interest rate because of the low interest rate environment. But I have yeah. a pretty good interest rate inside of the indexed policy. Okay. And I'm only using it for cash value in this in this case where mm -hmm. I'm going to completely cash it out in the future. Or I'll only use it for death benefit if I can just have it where I'm like, cool, I'm going to reduce this and just mm -hmm. have it, you know, what's my guaranteed amount that I could take or something like that. So I, okay. I kind of have some options in the future right now. We'll see what that is. It's a okay. year by year decision. Okay. Good All right. Know. There you go. Turn your thoughts into profit. Go to cashflowbanking.com. Have them look at your stuff, support you, make sure you're doing the right things. And uh, it's always depending on your circumstance and situation. But I like the question. Want to continue the path to be a better investor? Make sure that you're not losing money and taking too much risk. We'll click here and learn about strengths vesting.